Hey y'all, welcome back. Now listen, I know viewers of mine out there are well aware, Amazon, pretty cringe. Between its union busting, its monopolistic acts, the way they dodge any mild need to pay taxes, altogether just a pretty mid to bottom tier company. Now did you know that the actual problem with Amazon, the true travesty of their business model, is that they're too woke? That's, at least, according to Marco Rubio over here, who this weekend released an op-ed in the midst of Amazon's ongoing union-busting battle with a plant in Besmer, Alabama. Now, the reason you and I are here today is because this op-ed goes fucking hog wild in a way that I think is really important to look at and talk about, so that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be reading through a few choice sections of the op-ed and then go into the ramifications of it. Now, of course, I encourage all of y'all to go and read it beforehand or after this, because again, I do think it's really interesting uh, and I think it's important to kind of unpack on your own terms, but I'm going to be going over the real juicy cringe bits, so... If you'll excuse me for, for a bit of a dramatic reading here. Amazon may be headquartered in America, but it considers itself a citizen of the world. For decades, companies like Amazon have been allies to the left in the culture war. But when their bottom line is threatened, they turn to conservatives to save them. Republicans have rightly understood the dangers posed by the unchecked influence of labor unions. Adversarial relations between labor and management are wrong. They are wrong for both workers and our nation's economic competitiveness. But the days of conservatives being taken for granted by the business community are over. Here's my standard. When the conflict is between working Americans and a company whose leadership has decided to wage culture war against working class values, whatever that means, uh, the choice is easy. I support the workers, and that's why I stand with those at Amazon's Besmer Warehouse today. It is no fault of Amazon's workers if they feel the only option available to protect themselves against bad faith is to form a union. He says that like joining a union is some sort of taboo or thing that should be avoided at all costs. You know, man of the people over here. Plenty of American businesses act loyally to our country. Not to the workers, of course, to the country itself, I guess. Its workers are right to suspect that its management doesn't have their best interests in mind. Wealthy, woke CEOs. Okay, that's enough of this shit. I'm done. So yeah, I hope those little bits act as a sufficient uh, appetizer of sorts for y'all. But let's get into why exactly I think this piece is such an important read. And that's because in its short, like, five-minute read time, it acts as a sort of thesis statement in the severe limitations of right-wing populism. For example, this op-ed really shows the way that right-wing populism stresses nationalism and loyalty above a lot of other ideological gains. You see in the way he talks about Amazon's crimes that he talks about them harming America a lot. Often he's not talking about harming its people, you know, the folks that actually live in this shithole country, but the country itself. Like, he, he, he talks about America like it's a living, breathing neighbor of his. And then the absolutely most unhinged part of all this is the way he keeps using the word loyalty to our country here. I don't know about you guys, that feels like half a step removed from loyalty to the state. Like that's some dang something about that, some not so great territory. And like, I get that obviously US senators and representatives would prioritize American citizens, but there's something about the way he specifically focuses on loyalty to America that's a little concerning. Like, my problem with Amazon isn't that they did Americans wrong, it's that they did workers wrong. Like, whether it's workers in the UK, workers in Bangladesh, workers in Brazil, I'm concerned about their union busting and their awful work conditions, regardless of the country it takes place in. But it seems Marco Rubio's main critique here is that it's just that they're really, really mean to God's like chosen people or whatever. But it's also really important to note part of the reason for our difference in critiques is the fact that when I look at big businesses like that, I look at the exploitation on a systemic level, whereas he, an ardent capitalist, 
can only take so much of an issue with that sort of thing. So he has to package it all as if their crime is to the US citizens because he can't really come out and critique businesses that harshly. On top of all that, I love that he basically comes out and says the Republican big business quiet part out loud. <laughs> like he basically admits they've been bailing out harmful union busting businesses for years, that they played defense when companies like Amazon were doing this awful shit for decades. Even the title, Amazon should face unionization drive without Republican support within the larger context of him complaining about culture war stuff, suggests that there are plenty of other situations where he'd be more than happy to support the company union busting. And in fact, in the rest of the article, he basically admits that. Like he talks about when companies' bottom lines are threatened, they turn to conservatives to save them. And though he doesn't finish the sentence, the obvious conclusion there is that for a long time, conservatives have been more than happy to step in and back them up when their business model is threatened. It's also maybe the most present in the way that he talks about burning bridges with former allies. But in the way that he frames this issue, it's pretty clear that the act of burning bridges was not that they were mean to the workers, but just that they were being too woke. You know, once again, great way to show your, your support for the working class there. And altogether, what I think this op-ed shows more than anything else is that no matter how much Republicans like Marco Rubio want to be, they can never meaningfully be on the side of labor. Like throughout the op-ed, he puts all these weird asterisks around support for unions, like they're good if they're not adversarial, they're good if they're supporting the right level of politics, they're good if they're not too big or too abrasive. Like he can't, like he can't just straight up come out and say unions are a good tool for people to express their agency as workers and to to duke it out with the bosses that are always trying to to cut their wages. He has to put all these weird qualifiers on his support for unions because at his heart, Marco Rubio's a business person. He doesn't like things or people that get too much in the way of the profit model. And that's not too much of an extrapolation. He pretty explicitly says that. It's the most obvious in this line where he talks about one of the problems with unions being that they're bad for our nation's economic competitiveness. Like he complains that Amazon prioritizes profits over other concerns, yet here he is in this very same op-ed talking about how there's a very clear limit on how much power a union can agitate for, and that limit is when they start getting in the way of our economic competitiveness. Like that there's a certain point when American labor is getting too greedy and they need to be shut down so that our competitiveness can reign on. And I think more than anything, that reveals Marco Rubio will only fight for you up until the point that you get in the way of profit margins. And that is just one limitation that he displays in this op-ed. The other one shows the limitations of which this ideology is able to meaningfully criticize systems. Like this line here about the CEOs viewing people as a cog in a machine that prioritizes global profit margins. That's some downright socialist shit right there. It's so close to the correct answer, but because he ordinarily loves big businesses and loves ones that make profitability for the sake of the global competitiveness, he has to frame it in this weird way that actually the problem is that they're stoking the culture wars or that they're woke CEOs. He can't just step up, puff his chest out and truly stand with the workers. And therefore his systemic critique will always fall short because it needs be said, if we were to stop companies being woke all of a sudden, that wouldn't stop them prioritizing profit over the, the well-being of their workers. Solving this problem, which I don't even think is a problem, won't solve this one. I also think it's really interesting the way he categorizes a good American company. Considering how much he whines about the culture war in this essay, I'm really curious to what minimal extent the actual treatment of workers play into his calculation of good here. Like at what point in his calculation for a good or evil company is exploitation allowed in a good company? This moral label and the weight he puts on the culture war 
pretty directly implies there's a point at which he's okay with you getting screwed over so long as the business is sufficiently good for his culture war. And I really think this shines through in the bit of this article that got shared around a lot. This paragraph right here. He says, when the conflict is between working Americans and a company whose leadership has decided to wage culture war against working class values, I support the workers. But like, what happens if a company's fighting Marco Rubio's side of the culture war, but is still really shitty? Do those workers get no sympathy from you, Marco Rubio? Are they just fucked? Do you all of a sudden go back to the Republican playbook of playing defense for these companies? Like, what's, what's the end goal here? This paragraph pretty directly suggests that if it weren't for the supposed waged culture war, he might not be on the side of workers. Another limitation of his ideology here is when we see how much he whines about adversarial unions, the call for civility is in and of itself a limitation on labor. If you're lucky, you won't need it, but in all likelihood, you'll eventually come across a business unwilling to operate in good faith. So to Marco Rubio, I ask, is the option then to just remain nice and get ripped off, lest you anger Rubio and his Republican cronies, who then might call your organization dangerous and unhelpful? Is that the desired end goal for him? Businesses are, by their nature, adversarial to the needs of their workers. The goal of a well-run business is to give you as little as they can while taking as much from you as physically possible. So to counter that systemic force, you need a strong union. Like, let me ask you, some of you might be in a union and some of you might be thinking about it. By the way, if you're thinking about forming a union, the answer is always yes. But if you were in one, would you want a passive union that caves at the first sign of conflict? Or do you want one that fights for you? Rubio makes it sound like his bar for displaying conflict is pretty low. I wouldn't be surprised if he would consider a strike adversarial. Like that a union is only good when it's sitting in the boss's office acting real nice and not disrupting the precious global competitiveness at all. That's about all I have to say in the specifics of the piece, so I'll end by saying, in general, Marco Rubio's op-ed, while spoken in such rich passions, reveals to us the rigid limitations of what passes for right-wing populism in this country. They overly stress loyalty, crucifying businesses not for the shitty practices, but for being not loyal enough to America, which gets dangerously close to synonymous to the state, if you ask me. They can never really be on the side of the worker because their default priority is, and always will be, to business owners and their market competitiveness. And since unions hit a point of making businesses less profitable, their support for unions will always have a very defined endpoint. And lastly, I think the most damning part of this op-ed is the way that it reveals this ideology's failure to level meaningful systemic critiques. Like he literally talks about companies favoring profit over well-being, but he can only frame that as a lack of loyalty to America or being too woke and not a byproduct of businesses doing business-like things because he is, and always will be, on the side of the business person. And you know, more than anything else after reading this, I feel kind of sad for the working class on the right. With as echo chambery as things are right now, it's sad to see that shit like this passes for working class empowerment. Since the leaders of this movement are never really gonna go all the way for these guys, it legitimately bums me out to think about. Also, it would be a crime when talking about unions and all that to not give a quick shout outs to unions and co-ops. If you're ever thinking the question, should I form a union or a workers cooperative? The answer of course is always yes. So yeah, thanks for watching everyone. And a special shout out to all my lovely unionized patrons. On top of generously supporting me, patrons get access to exclusive content and early versions of every single one of my videos. On top of that, we're really close to unlocking the next patron goal, which would be a patron-exclusive Q&A video, so be sure to join me on Patreon if you want access to all those behind-the-scenes goodies. Be sure to toss this video a like and subscribe down below, making sure to ring that little bell so you can know the exact nanosecond I release my next video. Be sure to share this on whichever social medias you frequent, it really helps the channel out, 
and I greatly appreciate it. Also, be sure to follow me on Twitter over at Piley Benton so you can see me dunk on people like Marco Rubio more often. Thanks much, and I'll see you next time.